Mm -hmm. So um, let's move on to the Victorian period. So the um, second half of the uh, of the 19th century, uh, what we have here um, are uh, some Victorian landscapes. Uh, uh, the first one is by one of the pre-Raphaelites. They didn't really focus on the landscape very often. Sometimes they did. Later in life, uh, they experimented with uh, with landscapes, especially John Everett Miller. But here we have a very good uh, example of a relatively early pre-Raphaelite landscape by one of the principal members of the group called William Holman Hunt. The title is Our English Coast. Sometimes it's called the stray sheep. Uh, because that's what you have. You have the sheep on the hill overlooking uh, overlooking the sea. Uh, this was painted in the south of England and uh, again this is a realistic landscape and uh, you may try to google the information where exactly on the map uh, this was painted because this is what, uh, what the pre-Raphaelites would do. They would go outside and paint in nature. Uh, mostly it would be used as backgrounds for figurative paintings but in in some rare cases like this one uh, they would um, they would actually focus uh, only on the uh, on the uh, on the landscape so um, this has been seen as some sort of uh, some sort of uh, symbolic representation as well so not only a realistic image but a symbolic representation of uh, of perhaps the state of uh, the church of england with the uh, flock um um, resembling the faithful, the uh, the members of the Church of England, and uh, uh, the middle of the 19th century was the time of uh, of uh, some internal troubles within the church. Uh, so uh, this might be a comment on that. This might be a comment on uh, uh, the danger, the possible danger of invasion from uh, from the continent. Uh, probably this is soon after uh, the revolutions in Europe uh, in 1848 so probably this could be seen as, as some sort of uh, warning against uh, um, letting down the guard and um, if you look very very close uh, at the part where the sea is visible, you can see at the very far distance uh, um, a steamship. So a sign of modernity uh, that uh, um, that um, allows it uh, to be kind of dated. So it's, it's the 19th century. It looks like it has always been there with the nature and the uh, uh, sheep, but it's the modern times and with the modern problems. Um, another one, it's not by one of the pre-Raphaelites, but it is inspired by their style. William Dye's recollection of Pegwell Bay. Pegwell Bay was a popular place uh, for excursions uh, in the county of Kent and you can see the family of the painter himself uh, visiting the uh, the beach and uh, of course in the 19th century uh, people did not uh, sunbathe and they would go to the seaside mostly to uh, to walk and to uh, to inhale the sea air that was believed to be very beneficial for your lungs so we have the family of the of the painter uh, his uh, wife his son i think his two sisters as well um, walking on the uh, on the beach and collecting something they are actually collecting fossils this was a very uh, a very popular hobby in the uh, in the victorian period and some places like pegwell bay were quite uh, uh, quite uh, uh, famous for um, the fossils that you could find uh, there so um, they have some sort of, I would say, intellectual hobbies. So they are not just walking, they are collecting fossils. Uh, then we have uh, two murals 
from the north, from uh, the area uh, near uh, Newcastle in uh, in uh, um, Tyne and Ware, if you remember, uh, by uh, uh, again a Victorian painter, uh, William Bell, Bell Scott. Uh, you may want to Google the entire cycle. He decorated a hall in one of the uh, residences uh, there uh, with images showing the history of the English North and uh, the most modern uh, image shows a contemporary, um, contemporary scene called Iron and Coal and this is the, um, the shipyard uh, so the industrial um, industrial development uh, that made uh, Newcastle very very um, rich and uh, and uh, successful as a city we see a very characteristic bridge in Newcastle in the background this two level bridge with the train passing on the higher level uh, we see the uh, the ship works with some uh, workers um, uh, with some workers um, um, working with iron and coal and we see a girl in the foreground uh, well dressed well fed and uh, in her hands she holds a school book so this is another uh, another positive side of uh, industrial development and uh, economic growth of Britain. Uh, the oldest, I think, uh, image from this cycle shows uh, the Romans caused the wall to be built. So a scene, a kind of imagined scene of, uh, of the Roman leg legionaries uh, overseeing the, uh, the um, construction of uh, Hadrian's wall. Of course, it's also in the north. So, uh, so here we have the, the um, inspiration taken uh, taken by the artists uh, in the north uh, then towards the end of the uh, of the 19th century we start having images of city life uh, sometimes the um, beautiful attractive aspects of city life sometimes the darker sides such as the images in the cycle made in the 1870s by a French artist called Gustave Doré. He visited Britain and he was quite appalled by the poverty and squalor he found in some places, especially in London. Uh, this is one of the, uh, of the lithographs that he produced. You can Google more. It's called London, a pilgrimage. And it shows the scenes of um, city life from the um, from the poorer uh, districts in uh, in London, uh, so crammed little spaces, uh, heavy traffic, pollution. Here we have a viaduct with again a train passing in the distance, and in the foreground we have those very small poor working class houses with tiny uh, tiny. Um, it's not even gardens, but kind of backyards that could be used for drying your uh, laundry but then again the air pollution would uh, would cause the laundry to be dirty very soon as well. Uh, while we are speaking about poverty in 19th century London this is something I'd like to show you as well. Um, a very famous and very interesting map made in the 1880s by a, a man called Charles Booth and this is called the descriptive map of poverty in London. So here we have the map of the city of London, the, the well it's not Greater London but let's say the inner uh, city of London with the River Thames and uh, the residential quarters on two uh, banks of the River Thames uh, and you have the color coding and of course uh, it is relative to the um, to the wealth of the neighborhoods so uh, from the yellow um, through um, uh, through um, orange through 
different shades of red all the way to black and of course the darker the color the more um, squalid and poor the area um, the area uh, was so you can see that it's actually still um, reflected in the um, in the living arrangements uh, in London, so uh, in the south and west of London, generally uh, what we have are more um, prestigious and expensive living quarters and in the east and north uh, we have the poorer and um, less privileged uh, living areas uh, uh, such as the infamous uh, um, uh, district of, uh, of um, Whitechapel so um, the hound of, uh, of uh, Jack the Ripper if you remember I hope you can locate it on this historical map it's one of those black places the hopeless squalor poverty and crime uh, the last of the late 19th century artists I'd like to mention and then we move to the 20th century is John Atkinson Grimshaw uh, he had a specialty again a special style he liked uh, uh, twilight scenes and he liked uh, city scapes uh, at night or in the evening so you can see here two examples one shows uh, a K in Liverpool and another a street in London uh, and uh, what you can observe of course it's, it's this very um, atmospheric and, uh, and uh, beautiful um, lighting conditions uh, uh, but also the beginning of the use of, uh, of um, electric light and uh, gas light so, uh, so the early uh, early installations of uh, electric light probably in the shops and uh, the gas lamps uh, lighting the, uh, the city streets so um, Google if you want more examples in all of these cases just Google the name and see what comes up uh, then a few examples from the 20th century from the first half of the 20th century uh, which aspects of uh, British landscape uh, and also city life uh, would be inspirational for artists so the first part is uh, from the uh, from the 1910s Camden Town Group Camden Town if you know is part of London kind of artsy part uh, with uh, quite a lot of greenery still so we have two uh, two uh, examples by two artists one is called Spencer Gore the other well, William Radcliffe they show um, middle class but kind of prosperous middle class residential quarters with gardens and uh, the areas um, which became quite popular in the early uh, 20th century called the garden cities so the arrangements the residential quarters with a lot of greenery uh, with a lot of parks and uh, and uh, basically uh, the reappreciation of um, gardening and private gardens and incorporation of these uh, uh, beautiful green areas uh, into the uh, the cities of course not everywhere people could live in garden cities such as in Camden Town uh, large parts of Britain were um, industrialized and so quite neglected and polluted and uh, um, here we have another artist from Lancashire one of the most beloved uh, artists from the 20th century his name is L.S. Lorry um, his full names are never used really L.S. Lorry um, he lived in the town a uh, kind of industrial but grubby town of Pendlebury in Lancashire and he had quite a long life and a long career I've recently seen a feature film about him it's called Mrs. Laurie and Son because he had a uh, um, very intense and quite uh, um, quite um, dramatic um, relationship with his mother uh, so uh, if you're interested about his life story Mrs. Laurie and Son uh, and this is a very typical <clears throat> 
uh, two examples of his um, of his paintings showing basically cityscapes but uh, cityscapes from the industrial parts of Britain uh, especially again the areas he really knew from his own life like Lancashire so um, <clears throat> We do not have a lot of greenery. We have uh, quite crowded uh, uh, spaces with uh, the uh, factories and uh, the chimneys and uh, and so on. Uh, if artists were looking for a rural Arcadia, they would basically go to the south, to the south of England, and especially the area of Sussex, the area of the beautiful, very, uh, very, um, uh, interesting and uh, and uh, beautiful um, hills called the South Downs. You may recall when we talked about the uh, national parks. This is uh, this is the area of one of the national parks in the south. And uh, in the interwar period, uh, the artists, especially young artists, who were uh, who were shocked by the experience of the First World War. They would go to the south and they would paint there looking for inspiration, looking for peace and calm in their own minds as well. Uh, a very good example is the artist called Eric Ravilius and here we have some examples of his work from the interwar period showing the South Downs. So the hills, the meadows, you can even see uh, one of those uh, prehistoric um, uh, um, hill paintings, one of those uh, stylized horses, the, uh, the white horse of Uffington. You can see it in, on one of the one of the paintings here. Uh, and actually, the images of the south of England were used uh, in the early years, or just before the Second World War, for propaganda purposes. And here we have four posters. Uh, they were uh, used as posters, as postcards as well. Uh, they were designed by, uh, by uh, uh, Frank Newbold and they all had the same slogan, the same motto. Your Britain, fight for it now. And they show beautiful illustrations of country life of the south the south downs of the small uh, small towns of the uh, village churches uh, i guess the the one in the bottom right is actually salisbury cathedral again it's it's also in the south uh, and uh, these images were used to encourage young men and men generally but mostly young men to join the army and uh, and take part in the war to defend Britain. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, the people who joined the army who are responding to this propaganda were mostly coming from the areas such as those painted by Ellis Laurie. So the industrial cities of the Midlands, rather than the beautiful, peaceful South Downs. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the idea, the, uh, the concept of what Britain is and what kind of images should constitute Britain is definitely taken from the south. You might see it's inspired by Constable. It's no longer the romantic paintings, the romantic landscapes uh, are looking for dramatic conditions. This is kind of tranquilizer in uh, image form uh, with everything peaceful and rural and sunny and of course there is a threat but the threat is in the uh, in the slogan uh, that this um, this uh, beautiful uh, beautiful um, land and peaceful country is now threatened by uh, by the foreign inv invasion and the last image i want uh, i want to show you comes from the second world war and uh, from the uh, from the um 
painter that also had a long career and he was inspired by the English landscape uh, quite a lot so you might want to google him some more. His name was Paul Nash. He also took part in the First World War but then in the Second World War he became something of a kind of official painter um, producing works that would uh, document and also um, strengthen the morale of the uh, of the British people and this is a very interesting thing he uh, he painted uh, just as the Battle of Britain was uh, being fought and this is the Battle of Britain so it looks almost like an abstract painting but if you look closer it is a landscape again from the south of England with uh, um, uh, the sea and the, a kind of meandering river on a on a plain and what we see above it is uh, the smoke lines left by the plains because the battle of britain was fought in the air was fought by uh, by the plains and uh, um you can see um the uh, the evidence of the air battle uh, taking taking part over the uh, the landscape of Britain. So um, I hope you can see the uh, the changes in the fashions. You can see the changes in the perspective and also in the in the conception of what really is a British landscape. What makes the quintessential British or English landscape and uh, how it could be used for patriotic purposes. So that's it for this week. If you want more you can find more information on all of those painters and you can actually watch the, uh, the um, videos from the, uh, from the art uh, course. Uh, if not, see you next time. Thank you.